Hello, everybody. We welcome you to our Saturday morning Bible study. Thank you all for joining us. This morning is April 13th, 2019, and we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey. And this morning, our moderator is Shari from Pennsylvania. Good morning to all. Shall we start? I believe so. Okay. We have our quote, Affirmation of Christian Science. Quote, What does it declare? It affirms that God is the supreme being, infinite, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, the life of man, cause of the universe, the oldness of truth, love, intelligence, and substance, whom to know aright is life eternal. It affirms the immortality of life, the divinity of Christ, and the actuality of his resurrection and ascension. It acknowledges him as the way and the only way of salvation. It demands absolute obedience to the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. It demands the annihilation of sin and shows mankind how to resist and destroy it. It demands the elimination of disease and shows humanity how this is to be accomplished. End quote. Thank you. doesn't leave much else, does it? That's a good, good affirmation. People want to know what Christian science is. Absolute obedience to the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. So that's why it's so important we know what they are. Edward Kimball. Yeah. Kimball. Good for Kimball. Sorry. Yes, that's Kimball. Page 25 in Teaching and Addresses. Sorry. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Jeremy? All right. Just re reading all that just makes me wonder what Christian could have anything wrong with that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly that's a good stepping stone into Christian. It really is. It's a, it's a good good quote to have. People want to know what it is. Why? What made him such a wonderful lecturer? He could uh, appeal to the new person. Anyone else? If I'm if I'm going to handle error and I do one denial and ten affirmations, a lot of affirmations. Like I'm already made right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Okay. Keep going then. Okay, we're ready to continue the study of the Ten Commandments. And uh, Deuteronomy 8 this time, which I thought was very wonderful. And then Exodus 21 to 22 as our basis. And then, number we'll be discussing the rest of the commandments, starting at number 5, honor thy father and thy mother. And what's the rest of that? And then we have, excuse me? What's the rest of that commandment? Oh. So let me look at here, right here. These five days may be long. Yes. This the land that thy Lord has given me. Thank you, Fairly. Say, say the whole thing again, please, Fairly. 
Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long in this land that thy Lord has given thee. Thank you. I think it's the only commandment that gives the blessing to it, right? Yes. So, that's important. Uh, two, two of the definitions for honor that I found were to revere and to respect. Thank you. I found this is the um, commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So what does this commandment mean to people? Well, in Science and Health, Mrs. Eddy says that um, children should obey their parents. Insubordination is an evil, blighting the buds of self-government. So for me, it's, it's speaking to uh, uh, this concept of self-government through God, and that's the beginning of learning that. And uh, it's interesting, I, I noticed in a movie I saw last night, and then I had memories of other movies growing up that often, especially in the 80s, there was this real attitude that you didn't have to, uh, the movies were portraying people rebelling against their parents. And I know it's not new, but it's like this attitude of it's so cool and you have to do what they say and you should have a freedom to do what you want. And it's really um, an attack on this self-control of it and temperance and all the qualities that would go with that. That's what it speaks to me. That's very, very good. good. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, somewhere also, Mrs. A, uh, I don't remember where it is, uh, says that uh, children should obey their parents in all that is right. Yes. Actually, I was going to read that. Thank you for bringing that up. It's on read page that. 236 of Ms. Lane's writing, where Mrs. Eddy writes, to the child complaining of his parents, we have said, love and honor thy parents, and yield obedience to them in all that is right. And she continues, but you have the rights of conscience, as we all have, and must follow God in all your ways. Thank you very much, both of you. Yes. And what happened? Well, yeah, I saw a couple of things in searching this explanation, that this is in action and in attitude, and somewhere I saw that it was the only command in the scripture that promises long life as a reward. Right. That's why it's important to have that whole commandment. I, I read also that the family is the basic cell of both human society and the church. And in your training in the home, you learn to, you learn respect for all people. That's right, yes. That's why this attack on the family unit is not good. They have, you know, so many broken homes and people not obeying their parents and that which is right. So, because what happened to Mrs. Eddie when she was a child? She loved her mother and her father, but in the church, the congregational church she went to, what happened? She wouldn't agree with their doctrine. Yeah, she would not agree with her doctrine. She should all know that. I thought you all did. What doctrine did, uh, particularly, did she not agree with? The doctrine of predestination, that not all people would be saved, and she would never agree with that. She would never agree that her brothers and sisters or anyone would not be saved by a good God that she loved. Thank you. Yes, that's right. So that's why she added, in all that is right. 
but her conscience was was one with the father, so she wasn't. It wasn't this rebellious spirit that just wouldn't listen. And and you see, the point of this is obeying your parents and seeing them as something um, good and loving, if they are. That is able helps you to transfer this love to your loving father, mother, God, which is where our true obedience and loyalty go. But they should represent that to some degree. Now, what if they don't? What if you have parents that are not godly parents? Then what do you do? Maybe you have to love what they really are. Respect what the true self is. Well, in, in, in thinking about this one, I, I have to say my mom was the hardest person to, <laughs> to see rightly. And so when I came here and learned that God was our Father, Mother, God, I thought, well, I'm just going to start with that. Honor, honor God and move from there. But over time, learning how to see people correctly and knowing that all that, that stuff that was hard to deal with with her was not the truth of her has really helped me to put all that to rest. And uh, it's been a great healing for that. That's, that's wonderful. And, you know, when you get older and can understand it, it's, it's much more difficult as a child um, when you don't understand even perhaps these principles to, to have to... Yeah, to have to bear that. And it is a cross to bear if you've got parents who are, as I said, not godly. Luann, what do you have to say about this? Oh, I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought you might. <laughs> I wrote a whole page on, the, on this one commandment. Um, well, now that I'm had Christian science for a little while. I guess my view is is changed for the better, of course. Um, but as a child, I didn't understand this commandment at all, and God's telling me I need to honor my parents who are not honorable people. So I really, really struggled with that. But I can see now that um, I, wrote, I wrote this down, that children need it because without it, parents are just peers. It, it's how we come to recognize that there is a an authority above us to whom we are morally accountable. It's difficult to come to honor God without having a parent to honor. I think that society needs to... Um, it's good to have this, this commandment so that we can see that there is an authority higher than we are and to honor that. But... Um, and without it, that society is pretty much doomed to destruction. And, and it felt like that for myself. Like, there, there was no good in the world because I, I could not make that connection to honor someone who had authority over me. So it made it really difficult. So I, I'm so grateful for Christian science. It helped me to understand this commandment a lot better. That is very beautiful, Luann. Thank you, Luann. And I know now, too, you've seen that even in the hardest trials that you happened as a child, you realize that God was with you and watching over you. And he, he was truly, and he is truly, all of our father and mother. He is the one. That's why I love the article, Your Background, by Una Willard where she says, do you think you didn't have advantages of others or a great background or a great family? Well, the truth is, God is your mother, father. He is your family, the brothers and sisters in Christ. And then she goes through it so thoroughly, so by the time you're done with that short article, you feel very restored. Your background is only good. In the lesson this week, it says that evil has no history. And that's true if we've had an unfortunate background. 
That history is the history of dreams, of the Adam dream, something we shouldn't dwell on, just being true, 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 because it isn't true. God was always with us, and if we do dwell on it, we give it reality, and then we lick our wounds and we still carry all that pain and sorrow with us to the present day. And, and we don't need to do that, to let it go, give it up. Feels Thank good you. to let it go. Feels very good to let it go. Yes, it does. Now, there was something said last week in one of our meetings here. He says, when you think back on your parents, you can say, well, they did the best they could. And that meant a lot to me because it helps release any anguish or bad memories what may have happened some time ago. Hey, they did the best they could. Thank so, you. So at least it's something to release it. That's absolutely right. And and don't you want, if any of you are parents or grandparents, I mean, we've all made mistakes in, in that direction. Wouldn't you like your children to think, well, they did the best they could and to kind of forgive and forget and move on rather than, I'll never forget the day you did this or that and, you know, just... So do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And how, how important is obedience to God, whether we understand or not? It's extremely important. Because if we don't have obedience to God, then nothing nothing falls into place. And we're, we're totally out of the harmony of, of his being. We have to be obedient. Thank you. This is Eddie makes his point over and over again. That when your conscience speaks to you, and that's God, you obey. You don't wait to try to figure out why. You don't ask, well, where is this going to lead? If God directs you to take the step, you do it. Otherwise, you can't understand. Otherwise, nothing makes sense. So this, this commandment is really a commandment for children, to train children in that essential discipline of obeying, whether you understand or not. And remember, this was, you know, this was written at a time for a small group of Israelites who uh, had a requirement that they learn the law and a requirement that they keep the Sabbath and go to the synagogue and worship God and a requirement that they tell their children about the law. This was a relatively homogeneous society where parents were expected to be a good example. And they were called out if they weren't. And they all knew each other. They all lived close enough that they, you know, could... <laughs> so they kept each other in line. So it was to train children for the essential discipline of obedience. As many of you had said, that's a requirement to be able to obey God, to transfer that obedience to God, which is what he wrote, obey your parents in everything that is right. So what do you do if you have rebellious children? You don't spare the rod. Become a better you Christian don't give in. Is that Florence? That was me, Elizabeth. I just said you, you don't give in. That's what I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You love them enough to persevere. 
telling them. What, Linda, what did you say about insubordination? Uh, that it blights the buds of self. Uh, move to another page. Yeah, self government. Yeah, insubordination. insubordination is an evil. Yeah, it's an evil. You don't want your children acting evil. For their own good. You don't want them. Okay, I have to go back on it, but my father used to say, spoil, um, spare the rod and spoil the child. So we, we didn't get away with that. <laughs> exactly. And, are, and aren't you glad? <laughs> so when we're talking about the rod, are we talking about corporal punishment or just correction? Whatever God directs you out of love is necessary. Uh, Mrs. Hinton did say something about if you uh, spank a child, you're teaching him the sensation and manner. Uh, she did. She says a lot of things. She says a lot of things. Yeah, yeah let the spirit of love for God be your guide. I mean, this doesn't mean to brutally beat the child up. We're not talking about that. But if occasionally if you have to whack them, once, get their attention. Um, if I get a million emails over this, so be it. But, um, but you got to question the motivation. Yeah. It's got to be motivated by love. The thing that's really dangerous is if the child does something bad and you get angry and you're responding with anger, if you feel that coming on, you turn around and you walk the other way and get that resolved first in your mind. And when that's done and you can feel divine love moving you, then you can come back and take care of it. But not until then. Mrs. Evans used to talk about all the time that she was a very, very naughty, disobedient child. And she used to just wish that her mother would discipline her. And she wouldn't. Her mother was a very, very nice Christian scientist. And, and she wouldn't. And Mrs. Evans will tell about the times, the few times when she did. And the one time, or at least one time when when she was she talked back to her father, she was being very obnoxious, and her father whacked her, whacked her across the face. And what an impression that made on her. She was so grateful to him. She was because it because it showed her that he cared. So always it depends on the situation. Uh, you, you, as I said, never to in any way brutally hurt a child, that would be just awful. But if you need to get their attention very occasionally, uh, God would direct it. Didn't have to do it more than once. Yeah, that's it. And, yeah, <laughs> and he didn't have to do it more than once. The other thing she would talk about is when she, she was not being rude or whatever, she would get her mouth washed out with soap. Mrs. Evans. She said that was quite a lesson. They had this old-fashioned bar, bar soap and did not taste good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she loved to tell these stories, mainly because our society had got, has gotten so permissive. And, you know, we would go out in public and see kids screaming and hollering and rolling around on the floor and having temper tantrums, and, and nobody was doing anything about it. Now, that doesn't make a child happy. It makes them very miserable, and they will grow up and equally be as rebellious when they get older. So, and there, there are many other ways to, to discipline, you know. I, I know some of you, you take away certain privileges or boys when they're younger, car keys when they're older, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> iPad, whatever works. To do it and to be persistent, as Elizabeth said, you don't give in to it because it, it it's going to try you and try you to get you to give in, and you can't. But along with that, and maybe this is what Bruce was addressing, and perhaps this is the very most important thing, 
is to always know you are dealing with a child of God, that they are good, good children, good child. You're not dealing, you don't see it as with as some horrible being that you've brought forth, <laughs> God forbid. It's God's child, and you see them that way. So you expect them to do the right thing. You work with a statement in Science and Health that they are obedient to the mind that made them. And you hold to those thoughts and, and never do anything, as Bruce said, out of just sheer anger and frustration, because that's always wrong, and that will create more rebellion. So do it for, for love, but stand firm. Because Gary likes to say, and he came from a family of three boys, they're going to test and try you to see if you really believe what you say. <laughs> and you've got you've to gotta not back down. My southern cousins would say, say what you mean and mean what you say. And when you threaten things and say this, that, and the next thing, and then you don't follow through with the threats, then that means nothing to them. So then, you, they, then they learn that they can't call your bluff. Yes, and they will. And they will. But remember, your example is the most valuable learning they will have. So... And, and remember, even though, no matter how rebellious they may act, how they're telling you they don't believe in God, they hate you, they do this, they do that, they don't believe anything of it. Once they calm down, they're just just talking, okay? It's just words. They don't mean it. And eventually you will find out that that is absolutely right when you stay with the truth. And they are watching you, and they do want to do right, and they do want to be good, and they see... What, what they might see in school or elsewhere is can be upsetting when, when they see children getting away with things, getting away with cheating or dishonesty. Um, then you've got to come in all the all the more strong. We do not do that, as as Elizabeth was saying, and as she said, read on Wednesday. If you were if you step out of obedience to God. It puts you in a very unsafe position, and you're liable to come in contact with dishonest people or immoral people or whatever else. But when you stay with the Father and in strict obedience to his commandments and Sermon on the Mount, there's a security and a safety there. It, it just It's like a... a yeah, may the force be with you. Well, <laughs> the force is with you. And again, our example as parents is what will demonstrate that to the child. And if they have to speak up, you know, the rule is we as parents have to obey God. You as children have to obey God. Simple. For, your, for our own good, out of love for them. And it's wonderful to teach your children early this, these lessons, early. They're like little sponges, and they will, they will listen. But if you haven't done it early, then it's never too late. And, and what's in them, the truth is always in them, there. So you're talking to that truth that's in them. You're not talking to a disobedient mortal. You're talking to the child of God, and it's there somewhere, even though it doesn't seem to be apparent. And you keep at it. And it'll change as your thought changes. It brings healing. And I've seen it over and over and over again. It works. But love is the liberator. Love is the answer. And that's why we can say you can make a lot of mistakes. But if, if you were trying to do the best you could, and if the, your motive was love, well, it'll, it'll all work out. It'll all work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And it will. It never fails. This is not my opinion. These are rules of the universe, and they work when applied. So do you love enough to discipline? Do you love enough to be disciplined? Who's speaking? With Linda. I think okay. it's interesting. Um, Mrs. Eddie writes, 
that animal magnetism fosters suspicious distrust where honor is due. So it's really your protection to animal magnetism to learn how to honor uh, correctly. And Well, and remember, you know, children have this naturally within them. They have this love and obedience for what is right within them. when they oppose it or when they become insubordinate, it's not them. It's animal magnetism. It's something worldly that is that is influencing them erroneously. And the battle is not between parent and child. <laughs> the battle is with animal magnetism, with the false influence. That's what you're battling as a parent. And if the child knows that your love never changes and your love is solid as a rock, and when you deal with it as a false influence, a false belief, rather than a bad child, it melts everything quickly. Your children feel it. And that, never forget, you're addressing the child of God. I think, you know, many of the mistakes that I made in the past was that I would, I would forget that. And I would just be yelling at a disobedient mortal. <laughs> and that, that sets the battle in array, and that causes rebellion, rebellious children. And that statement, you know, do what I say, not what I do, well, that, as a scientist, you can't be living that. You've got to be living the truth. You've got to... You're telling them to do something. You you better darn well be doing it too. And as we've said before, you tell them in this house, I obey God, and you have to too. But then make sure you are. And that's a tall order. Some days. <laughs> it's a very tall order, yes. <laughs> and as we all, those of us who've had children, find out, our our children are somewhat of a scorecard. <laughs> <laughs> And Mrs. Evans loved to say that your children or your husband, you know, you might be able to present this wonderful front, but if, if your husband or your children are going crazy or wild or whatever, it shows you there's something more you need to do. It shows you're, you're, you're not resisting and destroying sin. And as scientists, we are taught God is love, everything is wonderful. And that's where, again, Mrs. Evans used to go crazy because she would see these Christian science children just running all over the place, being wild and obnoxious and have no sense of discipline. And that, that, is, not, that is not being a loving Christian scientist. It is not. Or a loving parent in any way, shape, or form. Much harder to take a stand be persistent with it out of love. And, you know, she <laughs> she had a son who was very disobedient and rebellious, so. <laughs> anyway. And a daughter. And a daughter, too. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're listening, God bless them both. <laughs> oh, dear. Well. It turned out all right. Yeah, they did. So we just... So honor thy father and thy mother. Very important. And, and as soon as you discover that God is your father and mother, well, that's what you want. And the better that is, and also that he is the father and mother of your child, and when you're tuned in to him, he will tell you how to handle this child. And they're all different, as you might have noticed. One, one you can just look at, and they'll leap into action. Another, you have to tie <laughs> do all kinds of things to get him to listen. But, and that's the kind of child Mrs. Evans was. And she said, and if you read the Carpenter books, she talks about the, the hunting dog. And the, it's the high-strung, really dog. active dog that needs a lot of training that actually becomes the best hunter. The docile one ever turn out to amount to much. So ne never despair if you're dealing with a high-strung 
this is hard, hard one to discipline because if you keep at it, they'll end up doing great good in this world. They will. They just need a little extra direction and love and, and discipline. But they'll get there. As, as in the case of Mrs. Evans. Look what she became. As in the case of Mrs. Eddy, I believe. Yeah, she was supposed to be quite... She was quite a handful of times. Lively, yeah, and she thought for herself, and that's always a good thing. And to question and to think for yourself. I mean, Gary was that way, according to what I hear. <laughs> he was always giving his parents a hard time. I'm not telling any stories. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't mind telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk later, but I'm not telling any stories. Okay, well, well, anyway, when disciplined, they can do great good. But, but if they are not, well, then that's a very sad situation. So, anybody else on this one? Any questions? Yes, uh, real quick, I just wanted to say that this is Eddie had a very interesting situation because her mother was, in a way, way ahead of her time because... She kept telling uh, Mary, uh, young Mrs. Eddy, that uh, when she was sickly, that through prayers to God, she could be healed. And the interesting thing was, was that whole battle over predestination, etc., was with her father, because he was afraid that she couldn't get into the church if she didn't agree to that. So that was old theology, and. Uh, so his actions made her sickly, her mother's actions made her well, and in the end when she did join the church, for some reason they let her in even though she didn't uh, agree to all the doctrines that, uh, like predestination. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Um, this is sorry, this is Florence once again. Um, Mrs. Eddy says something in two forty miscellaneous writings. She says, Teach the children early self government and teach them nothing that is wrong. If they see their their father with a cigarette in his mouth, suggest to them that the habit of smoking is not nice and that nothing but a loaf some worm naturally <laughs> chews tobacco. <laughs> there we are. Yes. Exactly. Yes, thank you very much. She called a spade a spade, and we she should did. too. She did that. Yep. Let's let the chips fly where they, where they may. Just trying to speak. Uh, the Matthew Henry had a couple of interesting things. Um, the last, of the uh, the last six of the Ten Commandments state our duty to ourselves and to one another, and explain the Great Commandment: Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And uh, godliness and honesty must go together. The fifth commandment concerns the duties we owe to our relations. Uh, Honor thy father and thy mother includes the esteem of them shown in our conduct, obedience to their lawful commands. Come when they call you, go where they send you, do what they bid you, refrain from what they uh, forbid you. And this is children cheerfully and from a principle of love and also submission to their counsels and corrections. And I just thought that was a really good way of putting this. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? I was just going to say um, I really commend that the idea of not giving in and standing firm. I, re- I know when our children were young, they knew that there was a line that they couldn't cross, and they never got spanked. I did keep a big wooden spoon on top of the refrigerator that they knew would come down if they got really naughty, but it was never used. Um, and then oh, when they were older, when they were teenagers, every it, just standing firm meant 
being willing to be embarrassed or embarrass them in public. But it was always, it ended up a good thing, and they always knew there was a line you didn't cross. Yeah, and that, that same line should be within us. There's a line that no one crosses. No one treats us improperly. There's this steel line that no one crosses. The good thing about that is that when they get older, you can still uh, pull that out for them because you haven't changed your opinion. You've always had that one uh, moral uh, line that you don't cross, and as long as it stays consistent, you can use it forever. Thank you. No, it's true, and that shows that you don't deviate. And and when they get older, you know, you... you you can tell them how you feel, but you can't make them do anything anymore, especially when they're not in your home anymore. You just let them know if they ask, and they will respect that. And these are all, again, the biblical truths that keep us safe. But if you don't know them, and so many parents don't seem to, they're studying all kinds of other books, aren't they, all these books about raising children, when we're truly, all the answers are in the Bible. Just look for them. They're there. Jeremy, did you want to say something? Okay. Bruce? Uh, it says, honor thy father and thy mother. And I gave a lot of thought about this word honor. I think it does not mean you simply go along with all the time. It's rather a call to see divine wisdom in action with them as well as within ourselves. Because, you know, Jesus said, he beheld the perfect man where sinning mortals appeared to mortals. It reminded me of a movie I saw once where there were two siblings, a brother and sister, and they were middle-aged at the time. They were trying to take care of their dad. The dad was behaving very annoyingly. And the sister asked the brother, what are we going to do? The brother says, we are going to honor him. I know this is a movie, but later on in the movie, the dad started to eat very well. I just remembered that. I found a word for honor is respect and revere on this one. Right, that's what our Barbara gave us. Yeah, I think we chewed this one pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Not chewed, but loving, lovingly illumined <laughs> this. Yes. <laughs> Different than chewing, Gary. Chew. <laughs> yeah, we've squeezed all the good out of the orange. Take it to our inward parts. Yeah, we exactly. take it to our inward parts and exactly. apply what will help you. But Oh, and one thing, too. Why do you think the, the uh, blessing on there? Blessings. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Why is that? The days will be long because you're useful to God, honoring your father and mother, like putting God's wisdom in action for all people concerned, for everyone. Yeah, and... And it's a safety. Learning, as, as you've all said, but just to think about this, learning the obedience as a child, obedience, and you transfer that obedience to God, then, yeah, he will lengthen your days. You'll have, a, have this understanding that you might not have had if your parents never cared enough to teach you obedience. Well, and also, isn't it the highest purpose for your life? Doesn't, doesn't it give you purpose to your life? Isn't the highest satisfaction be obedient to divine law? To see divine law heal everything in your life. Bring about good. So it's 
the safety, it's the purpose. It opens the door for everything good. Okay, now we can move on. There are no questions. Okay. Uh, number six, thou shalt not kill. And that's Exodus 20, 13. Well, Mrs. Eddy says something interesting on page 67 in Questions and Answers, miscellaneous writings. Thou shalt not kill, that is, thou shalt not strike at the eternal sense of life with a malicious aim, but shall know that by doing thus, thine own sense of life shall be forfeited. What does that mean? Does it mean something about um, uh, if you're believing, if life can be taken away, you're, you're believing it's not permanent, not eternal? Yeah, that's, that's true. Yes, Barbara, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it means if you feel like you want to kill someone or something, you're you're in a bad state of mind, thought. You're in a very destructive to yourself state of thought. I mean, it shows a really dangerous state of thought. That, that you are in if you feel that way. And you're definitely believing death in death in a very bad way. You're, you're certainly not knowing immortality of life. Yeah, you've, you've definitely dropped into the carnal mind. And Virgin says, The Savior showed that anger without cause violates the law, thou shalt not kill, and that hard words and cursing and all other displays of enmity and malice are forbidden by this commandment. And then he goes on, Ten commandments are full of meaning, meaning which many seem to adore. For instance, many a man will allow in and around his house in attention to the rules, of health and sanitary precaution, but it does not occur to him that he is trampling on the command, thou shalt not kill. Yet this rule forbids our doing anything which may cause injury to our neighbor's health and so deprive him of life. Many a deadly manufactured article, many an ill-ventilated shop, many a business with hours of excessive length is a standing breach of this command. Shall I say less of drinks, which lead so speedily to disease and death and crowd our cemeteries with untimely graves? I mean, really, we were taught here, you, you never work in a liquor store. You, you, Lillian has always abided by, we have pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey, a lot of them, but she never would accept a job at one of them, would you? No. No, because they are promoting drugs, the drug industry. These are ways, seemingly indirectly, but they're not indirectly, where we would kill and, and to swear or to speak out of anger um, is, is killing people's inspiration, killing people's joy. Is it not? Yes, it is. That's one of the things I was going to bring up, that, you know, there's more than one way to kill someone, not necessarily murder them. 
But you keep them down, um, you know, by saying horrible things to them, makes them think that they are lower than the lowest, things like that. Yes. Murderer from the beginning. Yes. It says in First John, whosoever... Sorry. Go ahead, Dale. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Thank you. Also, uh, Mac... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Matthew Henry says that when you tempt somebody into misconduct and that, uh, or breaking their heart, that is a form of uh, breaking the Sixth Commandment. Thank you. Who else was trying to speak? Um, this, is, this is that he said to James Gilman in Recollections of Mary Day Credit. One thing she emphasized in what she said, and that was that the ethics of Christian science raises people to a higher plane of action in which all is mental instead of material. In this plane of life, to steal is to take mental things that do not belong to us, and to kill is to hate our neighbor, and so on through the Decalogue. And uh, it made me think that uh, that's what malpractice is, is uh, hating somebody. That's right. Thank you. Malpractice and malicious malpractice is maliciously hating with the intent to harm. With the intent to harm. There's a penalty for that, a big one. You know, I was reading, I think just yesterday, someone who, whose son had a football injury and was prescribed, I forget, oxytonin or these drugs, Strong, strong drugs. And, and he was given a lot, a lot of it. And it, it he got addicted, and, he, and he, he didn't live very long. But there are penalties for this, and we can just know it. Because people who are doing this for financial gain, there will be... <laughs> not good. It will not be good. You are disobeying a commandment. Maybe you didn't put a gun to this poor fellow's head, but you might as well have, whoever that doctor was, however that came about. And there are many stories like this. Seems like a, a better a millstone about his neck than, than that. Situation. Absolutely, yes, yes, and these people who, this goes into the, in the next commandment, but they, who commit sexual acts or to children or all of this stuff that goes on, it's a form of killing, and there's a penalty for it. And what is the Christ, Jesus says, even to think these things. Look at the... Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> yes, yes. And they were turning the other way and letting it go on. There'll be penalties. There has to be, and we can know it, and that's why it might seem like people get away with things, but they don't. And these are crimes because they're disobeying this commandment. Now, Matthew Henry says, you know, self-defense, if you have to, then I guess you have to. But even that, as a scientist, we should pray never to be put into that situation. If we, if we love our neighbor as ourself, and know that nothing, no plague shall come nigh thy dwelling, then that's a great and tremendous safety. There's a movie out. I haven't seen it yet, but it's been recommended to me called Hacksaw Ridge, and it is about, I believe he was a Quaker, but he fought in World War II, one of the worst battles, and he, he refused to carry a gun. He was a conscientious objector. I don't know if any of you saw it, but anyway, he, he went into all kinds of battles just praying 
and knowing God would protect him, and he saved, I don't know, something like 75 men, never never shooting anyone. Um, no, but I, right, right. I tried it. It's a wonderful movie. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, and he, he received the Medal of Honor for that. Thank you. Yes, he did. He survived it, too. He survived the war. But to tell about it. So I do plan to watch it some night. But, um, yes. Jeffrey. What's, what's the name of the movie? Hacksaw Ridge. Oh, thank you. And I might add that he, after he had saved a bunch of men from an active battlefield up on a ridge, he prayed to God in his exhaustion at the edge as he was lowering them down by rope, one at a time, to his comrades who were waiting below. He was the only one up there with the wounded. He prayed to God, just one more, just one more, and got the strength to get one more. Pretty soon he had 75. At that point, they had to lower him down because he himself was wounded. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Thank you, Jeffrey. Just one more. Great. This goes back again to Elizabeth's reading Wednesday. They're very powerful, and and I'm going to announce it now, so she'll have to do it. But she'll do a a lesson on God the Preserver. Uh oh, I guess I'm committed now. (laughs) I know. I know. I. I couldn't resist. Well, it, was, it, it was a divine idea. It was, it, so, yeah, it was all a divine idea. Mary couldn't help No, I couldn't help <laughs> it. It was a very, I love that aspect of the only security for the claims of being profound in this science. And what security we have when we're living according to his rules and principles, when we are obeying our father, mother, God, and obeying his, yeah, Ten Commandments, Sermon on the Mount. Anyone else? Oh, to tempt, this is, this is Matthew Henry, to, to tempt men to vice and crimes which shorten life may be included. Then, it, you know, so these women who are being seductive or other things, that this is tempting people. It's dangerous to the person. But those things are not excused. I mean, Spurgeon goes on to say about the commandments, Ah, me, this law is high. I cannot attain it. I cannot attain to it. It is everywhere. It surrounds me. It tracks me to my bed and my board. It follows my steps and marks my ways wherever I may be. No moment does it seek to govern and demand obedience. There you are. (laughs) Run, but you can't hide. Yep. I mean, think of how deep it goes into all that we do. And that then commandment requires a spirit of kindness, long-suffering, and forgiveness. place of the anger and the hate. But think of it. The simple commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. When you love mankind, when you love your neighbor as God loves you, can you do anything other than bring out the best in them, encourage them, do their best, be their best. Anything that doesn't violates the sixth command. If you are indifferent to them, just indifference. Seven to the pound is indifference is hatred. You either love or you hate. If you're not loving, you're hating. And if you're hating, you are of a mind to kill. Kill their joy. Whatever. 
And Gilbert Carpenter, one of his quotes that stayed with me for quite a long time now is, um, you're either building up or tearing down, and if you're neutral, you're tearing down. Yeah. Really love that. No in between. And 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 in concerning the carpenters, Carpenter Junior. His quest in the in that pamphlet concerning the rights of man, his quest to get those books to England to prepare and to So they'd be safe. So they would be safe, yes. He passed on at an early age. His father lived much longer. But it was it was all that being pursued the way he was. Those are crimes. And there will be there are penalties for it, I'm sure. There were and are. I don't wish it on anybody. I would never wish it on anybody. But it's a warning. It's telling you of the fallen ambush. That I must do. And divine justice is swift and powerful. Yes. And it's never God punishing. God only loves but the error. All error can do is destroy itself. And when you cling to an error, especially when you know better, in belief, you will go yes. through... You suffer from its destruction. Yes, you will, until you let go and wake up. Any more on thou shalt not kill? It's a very important one, so if there's anyone who has anything more, please stand up. I know it's already been mentioned, the idea of indifference. And uh, it's something to watch out for because it can appear in innocence as well not doing anything wrong to somebody else. I'm okay. That's not good enough. Thank you. The difference oh, is it does kill. And I remember back in Mrs. Evans' teaching, she talked about when children are very young and they're just left alone and left indifferent. Pass away. Sadly. Love alone is life. Command is to love. That is life. The purpose of life. Thank you. That's a very important point. Yes. You're indifferent and don't care. And when you can do something, take action to help someone, and you don't, thou shalt not kill. Again, God, God directs you as to what to do and how to help. All of you said wonderful things today. I'm very grateful. Thank you all. And, and thank you, Shardy, for continuing our commandment. So important. So Hello. important. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Shardy. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.